Hey everyone, my name is Michael Everett and I'm a research scientist in the aeronautics and astronautics department at MIT. And today I'm gonna to be presenting some of our recent work as a tutorial uh, for the CDC session on safety verification and stability analysis of neural network driven systems. So the topic of today's tutorial is gonna be called neural network verification in control. So there's a lot of excitement and it has been going on for a long time about neural networks and control systems. This dates back at least to the 1960s. And more re recently, there's been um, demos and applications of some of these ideas of neural networks on safety critical systems. So today we're gonna to try and answer uh, a, and provide some tools to answer the key question of how can we certify the safety, performance and robustness properties of learning machines? And we're gonna go through this in four steps. So we're gonna first talk about how we can analyze neural networks in isolation. And that's gonna lead us to this propagator and partitioner framework that I'll describe. We'll show how to apply these ideas to robust deep reinforcement learning implementation. Then we'll show how to bring some of these tools into the neural feedback loop case where you have a neural network embedded in a closed loop system. And that's gonna to lead to these closed loop variants of the propagator and partitioner ideas. And then we'll close it out with some examples of how to actually implement these ideas in Python. So let's dive in, let's talk about a problem statement of how we might analyze a neural network in isolation. And so in a controls context, you may have a control that has been learned and the weights are embedded in a neural network. And for instance, here you have your state vector might have two components, X0 and X1, and those gets passed into the neural network, which outputs a amount that your actuator or your control effort should be for two different components of your system. So that's a, a classic use of a neural network control policy. And it works well when you just have a nominal measurement and you want to kind of find out what is the action your system should apply for that nominal measurement. What happens in practice though, is oftentimes we're given a trained neural network and a set of possible inputs to that network rather than just a single measurement. So this picture illustrates now, rather than just a nominal measurement, we may have some uncertainty about where that measurement really is and what state our system really is in. And that can lead to this description of our state as a set. So how do we pass that whole set through this neural network and compute the output set corresponding to that. And what this really means is, you know, for if we don't know exactly what state our system is, how can we be sure that we're not gonna apply a control that's unsafe for one of those different um, states? And actually computing this green region here, this green set is NP hard. And it's particularly difficult because of the nonlinearities that exist in the neural networks as activation functions, as well as the fact that your neural network is often very high dimensional. So if we can't, solve this problem exactly, because it'll take a really long time to compute. What we can do is the next best thing, which is compute bounds on the set of the possible neural network outputs. So that's this blue rectangle in this case. And that's gonna be the objective of the next several slides. So the first key idea I wanna talk about is this idea of a propagator. And a propagator's job is to propagate a set through a neural network, just from that, same as that um, diagram on the previous slide. So in a more mathematical sense, a propagator tries to solve this type of optimization problem. We're given some vector, which is gonna be the input to your neural network, x zero. Given that that lies within some set x, we wanna minimize some function of the output of our neural network. So that's the output um, z at the lth layer of our network. And the neural network is gonna induce two types of constraints. At each layer, there's gonna be weights and biases, which uh, modify our, uh, get multiplied and added to our current uh, input to that layer. And then there's gonna be a nonlinear activation, which we'll call sigma. And that's going to often be something like a ReLU or a sigmoid or a hyperbolic tangent. Those are common ones that get used. So those are kind of the constraints and the objective of this optimization problem. And so the propagator is trying to solve this problem. And the reason we're talking about this a little bit abstractly is because there's many different ways to solve this problem. And these propagators, which are different instances of the solution, differ in how they relax these sigma terms. So there's a spectrum of solutions um, for propagators. You have at one end, fast methods. At the other end, you have um, methods that are solving this problem exactly. The fast ones rely on oftentimes pretty coarse approximations. So given that the input to your nonlinearity um, lies within some known region, you can bound that the output of that nonlinearity is just from within some interval. And that's a very coarse approximation, but can lead to very fast computation times. If you go a little bit more um, tighter, you can say, given that your input to my nonlinearity lies within the set, I can actually come up with these linear upper and lower bounds on the uh, nonlinearity's outputs. So that's better. The green um, line segments can bound this nonlinearity better than this interval bounds, but you'll pay for it by a little bit more computation time. 
as well as you can do quadratic constraints, which can lead to even tighter bounds and semi-definite relaxations to improve the computational performance. And then if you go all the way to the extreme of trying to solve this problem exactly, um, there's methods in the literature to do that as well. And I've illustrated some ReLUs in this case, but again, this, these ideas of relaxations apply to really any of the commonly used activation functions. So the question may come up, why do you care about doing this fast? Um, there's kind of two reasons. One is that you may want to do this analysis online because you don't know what measurements your system is going to receive. And the other thing is oftentimes these analysis tools, which analysis was when we're trying to think about it, say a policy that's already been designed, those tools often um, first get designed for analysis, but then later down the road, we want to use those in the control design process. So if you're thinking about training a neural network and running some of these tools during the training process, you want them to be as fast as possible. Uh, otherwise, your training system will, will never converge. It will always be computing. All right, so there's a spectrum of solutions, and a lot of them are based on relaxations of your nonlinearities. And one of the problems in a real application of these ideas is that you don't really have control of the input set size. And if the input set size of your neural network uh, grows, for instance, if you are given a sensor that has a pretty large amount of noise, the relaxations uh, also get pretty loose. And there's sort of two reasons for this. The first is that the interval analysis between the layers, it, that is often based on things like approximating non-rectangles with rectangles. And so you can see in this diagram, even not even considering nonlinearities, uh, just the fact that rotations and, and warps and shears kind of happen, uh, that's one reason why large input sets cause problems. And the second thing is if you look at, uh, even just looking at a particular neuron uh, individually at one nonlinear activation, if you go from a small input set, um, so just looking at the ReLU within this smaller Z region, we can bound that pretty tightly, I guess you could say by this lighter green. But if you zoom out and you now have to consider a larger input set, now you have um, much looser bounds on the ReLU. So at any particular value of Z, um, there's much looser constraint given that you have a larger region over which you have to relax a nonlinearity. So now I'd like to introduce this idea of partitioning the input set as a strategy to address both of these two challenges. So if you think about just propagating the whole input set through the neural network, that's kind of what this first row shows. But if we instead think about splitting the input set into two chunks, we can propagate each of those two cells separately and think about the union of their outputs as our new returned answer. And the union of the, of the two outputs can oftentimes be much uh, a tighter approximation of the output set because some of the conservatism disappears. The same intuition applies when we look at the nonlinearities. If you think about a uh, large input set, um, this blue line is your nonlinearity, like a ReLU, and these green lines represent the linear bounds that could be computed. If we split that large region Z into two halves, so Z0 and Z1, over in Z0, we can bound the ReLU actually perfectly above and below um, by just a flat line. So we can get a perfect answer over there. And then over in region Z1, we get these orange curves to bound the uh, ReLU above and below. And those can be much tighter than the uh, green curves because they have to basically span a much larger space. So that should hopefully give some intuition for why partitioning is a promising method. And now the question is, how do you do this partition? And one of the first approaches in the literature did this in a pretty natural way, which is just uniformly start splitting the input set. So I'm going to show some diagrams like this on the next few slides. So let me just walk through what this means. Um, first, this is going to be the input to the neural network, the set. And then this is going to be our predicted output of the neural network. So if you just were to sample a bunch of points in this input set and just figure out, you know, what does that actually lead you to on the output of your neural network, you would end up with all these Monte Carlo samples of this black region. And so this is always going to be an under approximation, but you could sample for quite a long time and get pretty close to finding all of them. And so we're just going to bound that uh, with a convex hull here in red. So that's kind of the answer we're looking for. And as we partition our input set more and more, uh, we can actually get tighter and tighter approximations of that shape that we're trying to estimate perfectly, just because we're now thinking about taking the union of all these smaller and smaller sets of the output space. So a couple of questions come up for trying to improve on this algorithm. The first of which is, which of these cells should we be refining next? And when should we be done splitting cells? When are we you know, confident that we've split it enough? And that leads us to this greedy simulation guided algorithm that we proposed, which builds on some work um, which presented the simulation guided partitioning approach. And we make a few important 
changes to the algorithm. The first uh, kind of overall idea is we're going to use this guidance by taking n Monte Carlo samples. So just grab a bunch of points in your input set and pass this to your neural network. And that'll just give you a very rough uh, under approximation of what the output set looks like, just to give a kind of a, a flavor of what you're going for. Then we're going to compute the reachable set of the full input set, propagate that through the network, and that'll be a conservative outer approximation, and add that to a stack. Then at each step, we're going to go look at that stack and grab an element from it and say, if that element is within our um, Monte Carlo samples, good, we're done refining that. There's no reason to refine it anymore. If not, we're going to split that cell, uh, its input, pass both of those inputs through the network, and add those two outputs onto the stack. So then the question is, which element do you grab off the stack if there's more than one? And to do that, this is where the greedy idea comes in. And we recommend uh, in this algorithm that you grab whichever one is causing you to be basically further away from the Monte Carlo samples as just a guidance. So in this case, we would choose the red one. Maybe after that one has been refined, you get a couple of cells that are the, the, um, smaller, and then the, the purple cell would get split next. So you can just proceed in that kind of fashion. All right, so now what does this look like when we do a simulation guided partitioning uh, example? In this case, here is the input set. It's being split, not uniformly anymore, but uh, as the animation plays, you can see that different cells are refined. And the input set, again, could rec represent, say, sensor noise, a bound on what are all the possible inputs that be could be coming on into your neural network. Over on the other side, the output is our estimates of the neural network's output bounds are shrinking as they're getting closer and closer to the Monte Carlo samples. So that's a good sign. And of course, this rep represents what are all the possible outputs that my neural network could um, produce. Maybe this is the worst case. Maybe I care about the best case, or maybe I just want to understand the whole set of all the cases. Um, a, a little detail I want to point out is that we can tune or refine different parts of the input set based on what parts of the outputs that we care about. So if we only care about lower bounds for a particular application, we can say only the greedy simulation guided algorithm will only refine uh, just down in this bottom right corner because that's leading us to get tighter and tighter bounds. But it may not even worry about making these bounds up here tight because it may not matter. If you want a convex hull, you can see the algorithm will automatically refine in different parts of the input set um, to try and get this convex hull as tight as possible. So, okay, how do we, we talked about partitioners and propagators, and now let's try and unify this a little bit, going back to that problem I laid out at the beginning. So remember, we had this um, optimization problem where we have a input that lies within some set. We're trying to minimize some function of the neural network output and the subject to these two types of constraints. So I've highlighted this set and this activation because those are the two components of this optimization problem that these methods in the literature often try and address. So um, if we think about this, the propagators again on that spectrum, um, now we can think about their partitioners as oftentimes they're, they're, they're kind of defined in terms of being tied to a particular one of the propagators without really um, saying it explicitly. So what we did in some of our recent work is we showed that you know, not only can we um, add some more partitioners, but we can build this bridge between different propagators and partitioners and give you an ability to lie in many more places along this fast to exact spectrum, depending on your application that can be useful. And so zooming out a little bit, um, the inputs and outputs of a, of a framework like this Remember, we're trying to solve this problem where given some input set and some trained neural network, we want to understand what is bounds on the output set look like. And so now we can choose a propagator. And there's some instances of that um, shown right here. We can choose a partitioner. There's some instances of our options there. And then overall, this is going to be a, an analyzer object that's going to be doing the analysis. All of this idea is implemented at our GitHub page. And we'll walk through a little bit of um, how we actually code this up in terms of a Python example later in the tutorial. So this slide I'll just quickly go through to give a sense of the results, just thinking about approximation error versus computation time. So again, we wanna be in the bottom left corner of this plot to be computing things quickly and getting very low error. And this just shows for different propagators in the three boxes. Um, so an interval bound propagator, crown, which is based on linear programming and a semi-definite programming based solution. And for each of the curves, those are different variants of partitioners. And so this just, you know, to get make matters a little bit crazier, or we overlaid it all in one plot, just to give a sense of if you stack it all, everything against each other, you can compare the methods in the fields.
So there's, from thinking about this abstractly as a partition or propagator, there's many new algorithms that didn't exist that are further down into the bottom left on this curve um, at a better place on the error versus speed trade-off. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say in terms of uh, neural network analysis in isolation. Now let's talk for a little bit about how to bring this idea into reinforcement learning. So in particular, we're gonna look at how do we analyze a policy that's been learned and robustify its implementation? What do I mean by that? Well, it's very common to say, use deep reinforcement learning to train and control policy nowadays. And then even though that's been trained maybe in a really nice simulator, uh, you go out and deploy that on a real system with state uncertainty, whether that's from adversarial attacks, whether it's from sensor noise or just imperfect state estimates, uh, you're, you wanna be sure that you have this certifiable robustness to uncertainty, even though you have a deep reinforcement learning policy. So we've proposed this idea called certifiably robust deep reinforcement learning, and it will leverage some of the tools you'll see later on the slide where those come in, uh, relating back to the, the previous slides. So just to lay out the problem, um, we're thinking about typical RL that uses a simulator or something with good state measurements, and then you move and try and deploy that policy onto, say, a real system that only be able to measure a perturbed version of the state. And a typical implementation of RL would do something like this. Um, it would say, I want to choose the action which maximizes my value, given that I've measured this state. I call it SADV because it could be the adversary provided with that state. And so the action which maximizes this function. This function, of course, a value function in RL is telling you how much reward do I expect to accrue given that I'm in this state and I'm taking this action. So that's a natural thing to do when you have a good measurement. But if an adversary is attacking your states, that's probably a little bit sketchy. So instead, what we recommend is this robust version of the action selection rule, which is saying, let's choose the action which is the best under this minimum or this worst case realization of your Q value, where the worst case is with respect to the fact that your state could really lie anywhere within this measurement uh, ball around what the adversary provided you with. The challenge here is, of course, this red box is a really hard problem. In fact, it's so hard that it's the problem that we laid out at the beginning. Uh, we're trying to minimize Given that the input to a neural network is some in some set, uh, we want to minimize some function of the output of our neural network. So there we go. We can leverage some of the partitioners and propagators methods to approximate this bounds on this Q. Q in this case is going to be the deep Q network or some neural network that outputs values. And to be a little bit more formal, for some action A, if our state S lies within some ball, uh, we can come up with this lower bound QL on our Q function Q. And tying back to that example I showed a few slides ago, this is a great example where we may only care about the lower bounds. We may not care about what, how good Q values could be. We just want to defend against the worst case. So that leads us to this uh, lower, this, this action selection rule, um, Carl, where we choose the action which maximizes the lower bound of our Q function using our partition and propagators. So we deploy this in a couple examples. Here we show it in a collision avoidance setting, and here we showed it defending against in Atari. Um, if the ball is moved just a tiny bit on the screen, that's enough to make a, a nominally good RL agent uh, all of a sudden get destroyed by a computer. And so we recover a lot of that performance and the RL agent's able to win again. Over here on the left, just the collision avoidance setting, um, sort of if you just implement the rule, uh, this RL agent in orange will get to its goal, but it'll do it kind of slowly. If you add in the partitioning methods, the bounds on the worst case are tighter and tighter, and we can show that the, the agent gets there much quicker. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about reinforcement learning. And now let's talk about another direction, which is how do we do reachability analysis of neural feedback loops? And in particular, this is gonna be thinking about safety now. So how do we guarantee the safety of a system that has a learned controller in it? Um, so what we're gonna do is reachability analysis. So let me define what reachable sets are. First, I'll do it over in this cartoon form. Um, a reachable set is saying, given that my system starts in some set, I wanna understand what are all the possible states that my system could occupy in the future, even though I don't know the exact realizations of my noise um, that may occur. I wanna know every single state that my system may ever reach. This is useful because if you compute all these green boxes, which are the reachable sets, if you know that the final green box ends up in your goal set, that's cool. And if you know that none of those reachable sets intersect with your avoid sets, that's even better because you can put this stamp of approval and say, you know, this is verified to be safe. Even though you have a neural network control policy embedded in a feedback loop, uh, these are the types of tools that we're trying to provide. So the, the equations are defined over here in terms of those forward reachable sets as well. 
those are pretty standard in the literature. And we also just to make a kind of a small comment. We recently extended this idea to handle backward reachable sets as well, which is a little weird. Uh, if you think about passing sets backward through a neural network, uh, things blow up pretty quickly. So we have some solutions to, to dealing with that, but today we'll focus on the forward reachable problem. Uh, we're also going to assume that you have nonlinear dynamics. So here we go in terms of the kind of classic XT plus one is some function AX plus BU, plus you have some exogenous input and some noise. And then there's going to be an observation vector um, observation process, which is based on sort of a measurement of your true state plus some uh, sensor noise. And then the neural network controller is where all the nonlinearity is going to come in um, for the for this example. Uh, so again, super high dimensional nonlinear that's going to provide some uh, challenges for actually doing the reachability analysis. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? Uh, the exact reachable set analysis problem is trying to say, you know, given that you're trying to find, somebody tells you the shape of the output set that you're trying to produce, say we're trying to do a polytope, may it look something like this, where you're provided with A out, uh, which defines a normal vector for all of the different facets of your polytope. And you just want to know where uh, along this axis to each of these polytope facets lie to try and see like basically what are the all the half planes bounding my next state set. So the next state set is described by this polytope. AX is got to be less than or equal to B. We're going to try and find B that's as small as possible. And that's subject to these constraints that the next state has to follow our dynamics. So some function of the current state condition on our control pi. And then our current state set has to lie within some initial uh, condition. So given that, you know, basically, you know where the, the system started at time t, we're trying to figure out bounds on where the system's going to end up at time t plus one. Just as an example of A out, if you just put the identity matrix and the negative identity matrix stacked on top of each other, that'll give you a way to unbound the minimum maximum values of each of your next states. Of course, the exact solution of this gray optimization problem is going to be intractable, much like the problem we laid out in the beginning, thinking about neural networks in isolation for many of the same reasons. Your control policy has uh, got a bunch of nonlinearities in it, as well as high dimensionality. So to get around that, we sort of have a three-part approach. And it, the, the key idea is we're going to compute these sets recursively. So starting from an initial reachable set at time zero, which is the same as our initial conditions, we're going to recursively compute the reachable set at time t plus one, given that we know the reachable set at time t. So let's just think about how to do it at one step at a time now. The first step of our three steps is we're going to relax the neural network. So this is building on tools um, like Crown, for example, to be able to say, I want to know some affine bounds uh, as a relationship between the control, which is going to be, you know, the exact value is going to be pi, which may be super pi, super nonlinear. Um, but instead, we want to figure out this relaxed bounds, uh, which will be above and below pi for every point within this uh, known input set. So that's going to give you pi u and pi l an upper and lower control policy relaxation. We're going to then associate the upper and lower control with the upper and lower, basically what control is going to push you to the biggest and the smallest next state. And we could just do that based on a couple signs of matrices. So that's pretty easy. And then we're going to go to the third box, which is trying to find bounds on the next state. So passing the biggest and smallest closed loop control uh, relaxation through our dynamics, you know, the true dynamics are going to be really hard to analyze. So instead, we're going to look at the green versions of those, which are these relaxed forms based on the upper and lower relaxation of the control. And then given these easier to analyze um, versions of our dynamics, we can just look for the minimum and maximum values of those. And that'll tell you, given that your current state lies within this set, here's the biggest value that your control could, or your, your state could reach at the next time step. That turns out to be a linear program. Uh, and I'll walk through a little bit more technically how that comes to be. Um, deriving some of these equations on the next slide. So we'd like to um, figure out how can we derive bounds on the next state set. And let's do this in terms of, we want to find a minimum and maximum value of each element of our next state. So we'll start just by saying, uh, let's use the first row of A out, and we'll worry about that first. So in this case, it's going to be one, zero, 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 where there's however number, however many states you have, that's how many uh, zeros you'll have, uh, minus one. So that's just going to select uh, one, the first element out of xt plus one. And what we want to do is figure out what are the what goes in this question mark. What is this always going to be less than or equal to? Of course, our xt plus one has to be constrained by following our dynamics because um, the next state is always a function of our current state. 
conditioned on a control policy. So the first thing we can do is we can just plug in a relaxed version of pi, which is this upper closed loop pi. And that's always going to lead to a bigger next state um, than what we would do if we, if we were following pi exactly. So remember, this came from crown. We just select either the upper lower uh, relaxation. So we're going to use one of these dashed curves instead of the nonlinear pi exactly. The next um, bound we can apply on that is say, well, here we were just worried about a particular xt. But really, we should consider all the states at our current time step. And so the biggest of all those possible states is going to be bigger than um, just a, a particular one of those. Then we can substitute in our dynamics. So remember, f is going to be ax plus bu. We're going to just assume that uh, we have perfect measurements for this simple proof. And then we can substitute in the crown bounds. So essentially, instead of writing this as pi UCL, um, we can write the, the slope and intercept form. So gamma x plus, sorry, epsilon x plus gamma is just going to be the slope and the intercept form of one of these two bounds, whichever one we chose before. And now we can just move terms around, collect terms that have an x in them, and collect their constants over here. And this, fortunately, turns out to be a linear program, which is pretty cool because linear programs are can be solved very efficiently. And even better is if uh, xt is an LP ball, for instance, a rectangle, we have a closed form solution, which means we can basically solve these uh, super fast for anything uh, that were kind of the problems that we're interested in. So let's uh, think about this a little more abstractly. Um, we were talking about propagators, and that's what we talked about at the beginning of the talk, just thinking about analyzing neural networks in isolation. A propagator takes in an input set and outputs an output set estimate, and there's a spectrum of solutions. Now we have closed loop propagators that, given a xt, so a state set at the current time step, estimate the neural feedback loop's next state set, xt plus one. The closed loop propagators also lie within the spectrum. It's, a little more, bit more nuanced in terms of fast versus exact, but there's still a, a spectrum of solutions and some of them can be solved exactly. Other ones follow different relaxations. And that leads us basically from propagators to closed loop propagators. Similarly in partitioning, remember before we were trying to find how do we split up uh, the input set to tighten the output set. Now the question is in a closed loop setting, how do you split the current time set to tighten your estimate of the next time set? And so I've just listed a few example references for where you might lo look in the literature to see partitioners in the um, uh, isolated setting versus the closed loop setting. And then zooming out a little even more, I'm thinking about this as analyzers again. Remember, we had this diagram for neural networks in isolation where you're passing an input set just through a neural network and trying to find the output set. Now we can bring the same idea to the closed loop setting where we have this initial state set. We want to pass that through a closed loop analyzer and compute reachable set estimates for many time steps into the future. And this is going to lead us to other choices, like we can have different implementations of a closed loop propagator, different closed loop partitioners, and the analyzer will also know about our neural network controller and our dynamics. So I'll show an example of how that looks uh, in the closed loop setting for a double integrator right here, where we're splitting the input set and comparing our reachable set estimates in blue to the Monte Carlo samples at time step, say one, two, three, four, five into the future. And again, this is all uh, shown in our code base in Python. Um, and this is a great opportunity to actually walk through some of those examples. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, show some examples of how you would use our open source code to analyze some neural networks. And we'll start just thinking about neural networks in isolation. So this Python Jupyter notebook is just going to go through loading some libraries, um, setting a random seed. Uh, OK, so the first thing we're going to do is load our neural network controller. So we can choose our activation as hyperbolic tangent. You know, there's other options like ReLU and Sigmoid. And in this case, we're going to use this robot arm model that we imported up here from a, a paper in the literature. And that's just going to load this PyTorch object, which has a couple linear layers and a hyperbolic tangent. So a super small network, but just something to, to get started. We're going to define the input set. So our input range is going to go from uh, for the first state, x0. It's going to go from pi over 3 to 2 pi over 3. And same thing for the second state, from pi over 3 to 2 pi over 3. So that defines the set that we'd like to map through our neural network. We're going to set some of the partitioner hyperparameters. So things like we want to use the greedy sim guided algorithm for partitioning. Uh, we tell it we're going to let it run for two seconds, and then it should stop. And we want to come up with the tightest convex hold possible. So let's set up those hyperparameters. And then for a propagator, similarly, we're going to use the ground propagator, uh, and we're just going to get that set up. So once we set up those dictionaries, we can actually create the analyzer object, which is where all the magic happens. So the analyzer takes in our model. Uh, which is our neural network, and it creates an instance of this class. 
And then we pass in the hyperparameters and those will create some partitioner and propagator objects behind the scenes. So this analyzer has just been created and we have this analyzer object and that allows us to do this uh, most important operation, which is analyzer.getOutputRange, which as you might expect, you pass in an input range and it tells you an estimated bound on the neural network's outputs. So remember we gave it two seconds to compute and here it's gonna tell us that our output of the neural network is gonna range between like minus 12 to one in one dimension and from about three to 14 in the other dimension. So let's visualize that. Um, we've got this analyzer.visualize tool that takes in just a bunch of flags as well as the input range and the output range that we just computed. And it makes these nice plots just to give you a sense. And going back to the kind of the numbers here, minus 12 to one, well, that's about exactly what we see in this first dimension. Um, just to tie that back to this, this rectangle, now we have this convex all representation. We can be a little bit more exact uh, if we want to get a numerical result and compute the error using analyzer.get error, and it will give us some ratio of, of uh, how big this convex hull is relative to this uh, minus one. So, okay, that's, that's a really quick run through of um, the code for analyzing a neural network isolation. And so now let's open up the closed loop um, version of that Jupyter notebook. And what you'll see is it's very similar. So we're gonna load some similar libraries this time from the and then closed loop um, part of the repo. We'll set our random seed just to make sure the Monte Carlo samples are consistent from run to run. Um, let's see, this is taking a little longer. Okay, so um, we're gonna load our control policy pi and this one is going to be for the double integrator system. Uh, we've got three linear layers, two ReLUs. Again, pretty simple, small number of weights, just to show an example. We're going to load our dynamics model, which is defining xt plus one as a function of the current state and our control policy pi. Okay, so that has like an A, B, and C matrices embedded in it. We're going to define our initial state set. So this time it is going to be the initial state is going to lie between two and a half to three for x zero. And then for the double integrator's velocity, uh, minus a quarter to a quarter. And then we set these up, this is a NumPy array, and then we're gonna convert that um, array or that matrix into just this Python object that we call it, define the LP constraint. That just makes uh, some of the stuff behind the scenes be able to handle different types of uh, shapes of sets that we may be interested in. So very similar to before, set up our partitioner as greedy sim guided. We're gonna set up our propagator as using crown. And these are of course the closed loop variants of these. Um, that again happens behind the scenes. And now once again, we're gonna set up a closed loop analyzer just like we set up an analyzer before. But remember the closed loop analyzer needs a controller as well as the dynamics model. And it will also set up its partition and propagator. We can then compute reachable sets. So thinking five steps into the future, uh, we can say get reachable set, given that we have an input constraint, which is our initial state set, and just this dummy output constraint, which will get overwritten right here. And we tell it we wanna do for five steps. So we'll give that a second to compute. And these are the five time steps and the reachable sets. So this is saying that X zero, is at time step one going to range from about two to 2.75 uh, and going forward just like that. We can again visualize the uh, reachable sets. So here is our initial state set. Um, thinking about that running forward in time, uh, we have the blue sets represent these rectangles um, that we got the numbers associated with them. Now we can plot them and the corresponding partitions um, just like we talked about during the rest of the talk. And just to close it out, we can compute uh, errors of all of these things to get a numerical result um, to which will make it easier to analyze these things. So that's a really quick run through of how you could analyze a neural feedback loop and how you would analyze a neural network isolation using our repos. And we'd be really excited if you tried it out um, and gave us some feedback on what works and what doesn't work. So uh, have at it. So that's what I wanted to say in terms of uh, walking through all the different uh, topics for the day. So we talked about analyzing neural networks in isolation. Uh, we talked about applying the propagator and partitioning ideas to a robust deep reinforcement learning algorithm. We showed how to bring those ideas into the neural feedback loop settings to have closed loop versions of propagators and partitioners. And we walked through how to implement these ideas in Python. So there's a lot of uh, open problems left to solve, of course. Uh, first of all, um, you know, we were talking about partitioning the input set and that's great for being able to handle large input sets and large uncertainties, but it has this challenge that scaling to high dimensional uncertainties is still a, a, a topic for future work. So one possible idea is to find a way to project inputs into a space that has a lower dimensional uncertainty so that we can still leverage some of these techniques. In the reachability analysis setting for the neural feedback loops, remember we were trying to find some notion of safety to guarantee that the, the system would never leave a certain set. And one of the challenges there is that we're currently assuming that you have access to the true dynamics model. And maybe there's opportunities there where for a real system where there's some uncertainty in your dynamics that you don't know the A or B matrix perfectly, we could leverage some robust optimization techniques to account for that. 
So here I also wanted to list some recommended tutorials and references that are related to what we've talked about today. And I benefited a lot personally from reading and following along with some of these. So I definitely recommend checking them out if you want to continue to dive into this area. And then I listed some of the references here that we went through in the talk. Um, and feel free to just pause the video and, and look at these in more detail if you need to. Um, so with that, I think I'd like to wrap up and I'm really excited to take any questions or hear from the audience about ways that you might be interested in applying some of these ideas onto problems of your own. Thank you.